Chandra Naya. Now, um, good to see you again, mate. Thank you. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you on the channel the first time. You were the first person on this channel. Yes. And now you have the honor of being the first person to have been done twice on this channel. So, um, first of all, how does it feel to be, you know, having asked to be done twice? Uh, well, you know, uh, Chong, really privileged, uh, really happy to be here. And I uh, always remember that first session that we did. We and, did, right? Uh, we, have the, yes, we had a good one. We talked, we spoke for about three hours, I think. Yeah, and uh, that uh, you know a lot of people appreciated it, and I still walk in the street and they say, "Are you the Superman?" I said, "I'm not," but that's why he serious? called me. Yeah. yeah, people do say, "Are you the Superman?" I said, "No," but you know that's why he called me. Yeah. Every part of the title was meant. I did really mean that you. I felt that you were Asia's Superman, um, not because I felt that you know you were obviously you know the one that was going to save the entire uh, continent, but I did feel that we don't have enough people like you who speak their mind, who, who see very clearly the economics of the changing world order and uh, who is able to elucidate those points of view both in print as well as in, in voice. So henceforth, you are the first person to be spoken to and uh, henceforth, you are also the second person, in fact, the first person to have been asked back twice on the channel. Um, originally, I think we were going to address this in climate and environmental terms, yeah. but um, because of the swiftness in which the world order is, is altering its uh, perspectives, we are now talking about um, the world in the context of a rising geopolitical conflict. Yeah. And what appears to be now uh, a European issue could well be uh, um, widening very quickly uh, in a matter of time to a global issue. So I just want to ask you how, how closely you've been watching the, these developments. I mean, in terms of the, I assume you mean the Russia-Ukraine war. Yeah. Well, of course, like anyone else who's interested <coughs> Anyone else is interested in geopolitics, I've been watching it. I've also had, uh, because I belong to a couple of international organizations, uh, a couple of, uh, quite a few, um, uh, tense debates around what the organizations should say. To just give an example, one of the organizations I belong to, within the few days of the war, starting as European-based, uh, wanted to put out a statement about the war condemning Russia and all of that and I was against that not because I'm pro-Russia and uh, All wars are horrible because I couldn't understand the sort of hypocrisy of an organization that had never spoken anything about war uh, Was not taking a position and this was all being led by the European members and many of us in Asia etc said we feel it's awful that the war is going on but this sort of selective condemnation is part and parcel of uh, what I call a Western narrative in which, you know, there's the good guys and the bad guys, we're always the good guys, and the bad guys, you need to all join us and be our friends in either fighting them, condemning them, or sanctioning them. And I disagree with that. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm allowed to say the name of the institution you refer to. Uh, I oh, shall... you can, yeah. It's a, it's a, uh, I'm, a, I'm an executive committee member of the Club of Rome, and that's why and we had this discussion and debate. Yeah, very, very esteemed group of um, thought leaders, professionals, uh, intellectuals, ex-politicians, bureaucrats, business people, and, and what have you. That's right. By selection and by invitation only. Yes. Um, the thing is, what I think a lot of people don't realize is that there's been a lot of conflicts in the past, many of which have happened in, in uh, non-developed parts of the world, Asia, uh, South Philippines, uh, Southern Thailand, uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, uh, but they don't have those headlines that, that Russia, Ukraine has been having. Now, I just want to ask you, right, because, because what, what is happening, people who are living through this current, this current era, we are bombarded by a whole series of events and, you know, disasters and, you know, we've just come out of COVID. It's, it's been a very tough few yes, years, right? Absolutely. Um, how do we make sense of what's going on? In the context of a changing world order, Chandran, how do we make sense of what's going on? Well, there's, uh, you know, various ways to make sense, but it all depends on also your level of interest in the history of the world. And so I'm not going to claim to be uh, uh, an expert in the history of Russia and its uh, in relation to the ex-Soviet uh, Union member states, etc. But, you know, anyone who knows the history will know that this is an extremely complex uh, issue. And this is how, you know, geopolitics and proxy wars are typically triggered. But the one thing that has become clear out of this, and, and which I have commented on, and in fact, today I had a piece published in the Nikkei, which 
most people will know is owns the FT even. I was actually invited to comment because I think at the editorial level, people felt that there was a need for someone to say, um, all wars are bad in my view, uh, all casualties are bad. But what was very interesting about this war was the reaction of the non-Western world to what you alluded to, the sort of amplification of the tragedy that is happening to civilians. But no one talked about the tragedy and the death and the mayhem uh, inflicted on Iraqis, uh, Afghanistans, etc. In that case, the aggressor was the good guys. They were going to free these people. And if 10,000 people died in a day, well, that was the price to pay for freedom. In this instance, you know, the, uh, the conflict was essentially made out to be that it is so bad because, you know, Western civilians are dying. And of course, it's a tragedy. But no one talked about Yemen. And that uh, amplification of that hysteria almost I think God, in this day and age of uh, essentially technology, the non-Western world wondering about the hypocrisy. And you all know the, the videos and other things that have gone viral about in the early days how Western commentators and some of the leading uh, channels uh, were essentially making statements that one can only describe as deeply rooted in racism and almost you know, white lives are more important than non-white lives. So in the context of how the world sees um, what's happening in the Ukraine, Chandran, we know that uh, most of the time we read, especially I, I have been doing so from the lens of The Economist, uh, Agence French Press, AFP, Reuters, Bloomberg, CNBC, Financial Times, um, there's a problem there because they're all owned by, you know, Western establishment. Yeah. Albeit they've been around for a long time. I used yeah. to work for them. Yeah. Um, we don't have um, a global, credible, a credible global fine, um, news channel that comes from Asia and looks at the world through a different lens. I know we've talked about this in the past, yes. right? Um, we've got Channel News Asia, we've got Al Jazeera, we've got uh, South China Morning Post. Those, um, those are not bad. But they seem to be occupying more of a Western narrative than than a, than a yeah. purely predominantly natively Asian, yeah. yes, yeah. independently Asian yeah. lens, right? Yeah. Is that a problem? Oh, it's a huge problem. I mean, in recent years, uh, particularly you know, in the last three four years, uh, there has been a growing recognition finally, and it's a good thing. Now we need to act across Asia and in Africa and the Middle East for a different for for a more sort of multipolar sort of uh, media narrative, right? And the Ukraine uh, crisis in terms of the way the, the Western media, the ones you mentioned, uh, depicted this, uh, really exposed uh, how uh, prevailing this dominant, prevalent this dominance is and how these attitudes need to change. The question really is also when you mention Channel News Asia and others, even Al Jazeera, uh, the, the, the power of the, the Western media and the government and the Western public, in fact, and of course, Western business interests itself, so, so extensive that even these channels are reluctant to essentially speak up, but because there are numerous ways in that they will get labeled and chastised and even, um, even sanctioned. Uh, another interesting problem is that many of the hosts and people on these uh, channels have been brought up on the diet of neoconservative sort of liberal narratives from the West. They bought into it as well. Or well, studied abroad in right. the West. Right. And instead of allowing those opportunities to get them to see a wider perspective, they completely bought into that. And this is very important for people to understand that you don't have to essentially reject. And having a non-Western worldview is not necessarily an anti-Western worldview. And people are so afraid of being labeled anti-Western that they don't want to do anything. But the more insidious thing is the capture of mind of elites in this part of the world, and they run the media groups and all of that. So they're very, very reluctant to do this. Al Jazeera, for instance, was very interesting the, the way they are covering it. But if you look at many of the anchors, they are the Westerners or people steeped in the Western narrative and brought up in the West, though they may have brown and Chinese faces, etc. Yeah, and I just get the impression that um, the world is moving very fast, yeah. but industries and verticals move at different speeds. Yes. So the media is still, well, stuck in the past. Um, but but the it's world conveniently stuck in the past. It's conveniently stuck in the because past. Because that's where the power resides in the Western media. And so therefore it needs to uh, retain its power. And it's part of the tool of the, the, the sort of the Western sort of infrastructure. 
And, you know, liberal journalists who say they work for freedom, etc., have great difficulty accepting that they work for essentially the all world order and to preserve it. And in that sense, they seek to, what I describe in my book, you know, preserve white privilege. Yeah. So when I left the UK in 2009, I could already see that the Square Mile in London was in a state of decay. And I could discernibly see the decay happening on a daily basis. Yeah. People were leaving London to work in Asia. Uh, money was leaving London to go to Hong Kong and to Shenzhen and to Hang Seng and to Shanghai and to Singapore. Um, and I could see that development and innovation and technology and growth and human capital development was all happening in Asia. So, as, you know, different speeds at different levels, right? The media is still stuck in the past. But it's getting abundantly clear now that Asia is where the seat of money is and Asia is where the seat of power increasingly is. America doesn't like that. Great Britain doesn't like that. France and Canada don't like it, nor do they appear to like it. Uh, and that's why it, it appears that they are chafing at this um, new world order that everybody seems to be talking about. You know, people like Ray Dalio of Bridgewater, he talks about it all the time. He writes extensively in LinkedIn about it. Um, and it just appears that this, this Russia-Ukraine conflict seems to manifest the allies that are shaping up on, on both sides of the divide. You've got the uh, Ukrainians with NATO and America and, and, and the UK, and Canada and Australia on one side. Then on the other side, you've got the Russians and ostensibly allies with China. And then, uh, and then people like us in Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, who've got to, at some point in time, make a choice between do we get into bed with the Americans or do we get into bed with the, with the Chinese? Now, it, it seems as if that timeline is compressing very quickly. I think, you know, there's so much that you, in what you said that uh, I think there's, uh, it's important not to conflate all of these things into one sort of global trend. There are major shifts happening. I think the most, the biggest shift is essentially uh, the sharing of power. I don't want to call it just a shift of power, but there has to be an inevitable sharing of power. So, yes, we are today talking about the Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, war, unfortunate as it is. But let's just leave that aside if we can. But what dominated the headlines for the last four years? It was the the Western-led, the, no, the US-led Western sort of rejection of China, which you kind of mentioned about. Uh, why was that so? And if you, you know, cut away from all the sort of hubristic geopolitical analysis, in my view, it's very simple. The inability of the, the West, which dominated the world, created the, the world order, even post-Second World War, to essentially ensure its primacy in global affairs, be it geopolitics and business, and my book refers to all of those, uh, to confront, for the first time, a non-Caucasian civilization. They're the Chinese. And then you start demonizing them. Uh, I often say to my Indian friends, uh, when the Indians get their act together, they be after you too. For so, sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, the only problems are the Indians are quite good at speaking English and can take you on too. The Chinese are, come from a different uh, sort of, uh, you know, culture, etc. And they are not in the sort of PR game or playing, you know, uh, the news media game as much. So the demonizing of China, then it's almost, if you, you know, if I didn't know better, I would almost say it's uh, xenophobic, it's racist, right? So that's where it started. The fundamental issue here is the inability of the West to cope with the rise, with the creation of a post-Western world. China at the moment is leading that charge, uh, but others will join and be part of that mix of non-Western countries taking their place at the, the main table. Yeah, okay. So it seems as if we are at a very early stage of this conflict, right? And um we don't quite know what to make of it. A lot of people don't realize the perspectives, um, the dimensions, and what's at stake here. Yeah. Um, I know people like you do because you look past and you look forward and you look at the, at the current era as well. Um, and you have been chafing at, at this existing world order, which is by and large um, prejudicial, negatively, um, um, compromising, um, Unfair, selfish. Wholly unfair. Wholly unfair. Yet it's called rules-based, and it's not a rules-based order yeah. at all. And that dismantling of the rules-based order is fundamental to the sort of equity for a post-Western world. And that is why the Western world, Europe and the United States, and its little brothers in Canada and uh, Australia, 
and tiny brothers in New Zealand all come together. What binds them together? The white tribe. And within that white tribe, there's essentially the Anglosphere, which always comes together. And if you're non non-Westerner or you're a non-Anglo-Saxon, it is so crystal clear what this is all about. And in fact, if you look at the, the sort of the Anglosphere, I mean, they're all settler communities. Their history is, you know, drenched in blood, exploitation, etc. And they've had that privilege of, uh, you know, reaping all of the, that, that plunder. And so all of a sudden, they have to confront a new reality. Others have woken up to that history. And we're not going backwards because we have better things to do. But let us at least go forward. But yet these instruments of the old order, the so-called world, uh, you know, rules-based order, are used to punish anyone who deviates. You know, the monetary system, sanctions, etc., are used to punish anyone who deviates from uh, our way or the highway. Yeah, I want to put something to you, okay? Because when we talk about the Asian patriarchy, uh, sorry, the, the, the white, the whites are privileged, the white patriarchy, it doesn't go back to the Second World War with the Americans and the French and the British, no, no, right? No. It goes further back. 400 years. More, maybe. because you had, yeah. Yeah, you had the British yeah. East India Company, and they went around the world colonizing the Spanish in Latin America. And before that, things, yeah. and before that, the Dutch Guild with the Dutch East India Company. That's so right. it's been at least maybe six, seven hundred years, yes. right? That's right. But it seems as if those two or three world orders are coming to an end because, yeah, I mean, we had the Dutch Guild as the reserve currency of the world at the That's time. Right. Then you had the British pound, which then dissolved in the wake of the Second World War. Then you and got then the US, US dollar reserve. now, which now seems to be waning in, in importance. And now people are talking about accepting the yuan. You know, Saudi oil, for example, is being accepting in, to be paid in, in the yuan. Russia might, might be getting around the sanctions by settling in the, yes. in, the, in, the, in the Chinese financial system, for example. And they should. And yeah, and maybe they should because... And what's know, wrong with that? And there's you nothing know, wrong with that. Two sovereign nations are doing a deal. What's wrong with China buying Russian oil? So my question is this, right? With every world order comes its own brand of um, fear and repression and, and, and violence and conflict, right? Assuming that it's the era of the Chinese-Russian uh, allied, you know, whatever, uh, force now, how do we anticipate what they will bring to the table when, if and when they come into play? So, you, I mean, there is a, there is an important thing that you said that needs to be uh, discussed. You said with every world order. I would argue, although they, as you said, there was the, you know, the primacy of the Dutch for a little while, the British and the Americans, but it was essentially European civilizations yeah. that went out and said the world is ours and we can plunder it. We are superior beings. Our uh, God's better than everybody else, and therefore we have a right to plunder. And then they enforce that for four, five hundred years. Now, for the first time, so there hasn't been several world orders because it's essentially been a European world order with clashes among the Europeans, and then they fought among themselves. They had the First World War, the Second World War, nothing to do with us, but we got all uh, entangled in that hundreds of millions of uh, non-Europeans died in those wars. But this, in a, you know, at a higher level, is the first time there's a shift away from the, the Europeans uh, and the Western tribe to something new. So we should not be uh, you know, just assuming that the next order is one in which there will be a dominance. There could be a sharing of power. So if we are as we all say, in an era of great uh, social enlightenment and significance, then I call upon the Europeans and the Westerners to essentially make sure that they are uh, willing to share power. Do you think they'll be willing to share power? I think it's very difficult, and that's what we're saying. I think the Europeans may be uh, more enlightened given that uh, the wars that they have created, etc. I think the Americans are sort of Johnny come lately to the table as a civilization will find it more difficult. The whole American culture is based on exceptionalism. Uh, Donald Trump said what most Americans believe, we are number one, right? They will find it more difficult, but there's no running away from the arrival of the others, the rise of the rest. There's no running away. And the Western world just needs to accept they are a minority. They are an important part of the globe. They have great innovations, etc. But they have to live with others. They cannot continue to impose. And they have to sort of get off that sort of imperial mindset, which many still uh, hold on to. 
Yeah, there's a rising awareness that the Chinese model seems to be one of uh, mutual uh, benefit yes. and sharing of uh, resources, yes. right? Whereas in the past, and you could see this with the, with the US, it's, it's winner takes all. Winner loser, right? It's a white I, settler community. Correct. Uh, they went and you know basically uh, annihilated the genocidal yeah. annihilation of the native tribes. The same with the Australians. The same with the uh, the New Zealand. The same with the Canadians. So the entire civilizational understanding is one of conflict, bloodshed, and conquest. Yes. Not all societies are steeped in that. So I know you spent some time in Hong Kong. I know you're very close to the Chinese uh, government and the people that run the powers in the highest corridors of, of government. What can you tell us about the Chinese model? Yeah, firstly, I, I would say I, I can't, no one should say they're close, but I have enough, uh, should I say, interactions and I've lived enough, in, uh, worked enough in China to understand. What I think, uh, you know, when I sort of talk about China, quite a, t a lot of times, and especially looking like me, uh, people think, oh, you must, use, you're strange, you know, you support China, etc. No, I'm looking at the world we live in. I'm looking at what the future looks like, particularly in relation to my, one of my core interests, as you know, which is how do 10 billion people in 2050 live? How do we get organized? The existential threats of climate, uh, pandemics, resource scarcity, and all of those things. How do we get organized? And we get organized not through, you know, fantasies about free markets, and here's another app, which is the kind of American model, and everyone can have everything they have. We're going to get organized very differently. So I look around the world, and of course I look at the history as well, and see, hey, here's a country that has figured a certain way out, and the results are self-evident unless you're prejudicial and you don't want to accept it. So China, as of last year, announced that they lifted something like 800 million people out of dire, uh, dire poverty. That's something everyone knows. Even the World Bank will acknowledge that. So then you look at that model and say, what is it that they are doing right? right? So there are certain things they are doing right, and there are certain things they are doing wrong as well. And I'm the first to say when I get an opportunity, in forums in China, et cetera, to say one of the things China has got to be very careful about is because it's so big, because it has innovated in such profound ways over the last 30 years, because it needs to essentially have resources, it needs to be careful that it doesn't become a, a plundering state, a, a, a state that uses its might to essentially extract. The problem we have in the Western world is because that is their history, you know, you become more powerful, you exploit ex other people, etc. And it's in the DNA of these sort of settler communities, particularly in the United States. They believe every civilization will work in this way. I, ho I, I believe that is not in the Chinese DNA to do this. And then the other thing we need to understand is we in Asia and other parts of the world need to remind the Chinese you can't act this way. We have to remind them of you know, their civilizational obligations, etc. So that, that is the work we have to do, but we have all kind of bought into this fear-mongering of essentially uh, a, a white settler civilization that says everything is about who can take what, and the more powerful we are, we will plunder, rape, etc. Uh, and then say China will do the same. I don't think China will do the same, but we have to be very careful, and we have to work with China and India when it rises to make sure that they understand. And that's a whole different conversation about how political economies operate. Yeah, you're right. I mean, man it, and human nature have, uh, have had their roots in battle and conflict for thousands of years, even before these world orders have been discussed. Yes. I venture to think that even the Chinese, for all their, you know, and I'm Chinese myself, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, we are hearts, you know, conflict personalities. We, we thrive on, you know, um, interactions and at some point, they can boil over into, of course, into conflict. They're human beings, yeah. Do you think that China is ready to take on the leadership, uh, leadership role in the world, Chandran? I mean, again, I don't want to profess to have any particular insights. My view is, and the Chinese have stated this uh, numerous times, they have no interest in being number one. They have no interest what in What makes you so being, sure? No, this, this is why I'm saying they've stated. They have no interest in being number one. They have no interest in leading the world. They want to be partners in a world. But to your point about what, what makes me so sure, well, no one can be so sure. 
So people like us, uh, you know, who think the Chinese uh, development is, uh, is astounding in its terms of its social impacts and the, upper, the, the, the impact of the human condition, uh, where we have an opportunity is to remind China of the dangers of large powers growing wealthier who then seek to essentially seek resources and almost inadvertently sort of stumble into becoming imperial, controlling, etc. And that's the work that needs to be done and we should do it in a constructive way. If we're saying that the 21st century, the human condition is advanced, we're not, you know, where we were 500 years ago. So I'm not, I'm not saying anyone can be sure, but I think the work that the Chinese do and amplify in the way they talk about these things suggests that it's a different way of looking at cooperation. And that's the work that we all need to ensure we work with China and a rising India and Africa uh, to create a new world, which is what I call the post-Western world. Yeah, uh, it just seems that, because I don't spend a lot of time in China, right? Yeah. Um, but it just seems to me that the China's success has come as a result of its, um, its clear direction from the top down. Yes. In the absence of what we know as democracy yes. and, and the vote of the people. Yes. which can tend to slow the mechanisms down. When you've got a strong leadership that knows where it wants to go, it can be very fast. Yes. But that comes at a price because then you don't get a consensus built into the decisions. Now, that's fine for China because that has worked for 1.4 billion Chinese in China. But if and when China takes the head you know, table, position at the head of the table, then it's got to work with another 1.2 billion people in India, another 700 million people in ASEAN, uh, another few hundred million people out of, out of India and it's got to take this, this leadership role which then makes us ask do they, will they be able to, to lead this uh, new order? Well, you know, first there's a couple of things here I'd like to dissect. First you said uh, democracy and consensus. Well, most democracies are not built on consensus. Not really, right? The fact that every four years you can have the charade where people vote, look at the United States, that's not consensus building, yeah. right? Uh, then we, you know, you've suggested that because the Chinese don't have that system, I would argue from what I know, and very few people understand this, I actually with the Club of Rome China produce a report and I'm happy to you know, share the links with anyone who's interested, of a report on understanding China. Most people have no understanding. Coming back to the media issue, uh, most people here in Malaysia too that I know, you know, CNN, BBC, it's all anti-China stuff. So everyone thinks, oh, that's a very bad place. I'm not going to stand here and say China is a perfect place. But you have to be aware of the amount of, uh, you know, uh, vitriolic stuff, lies that are coming out about what is China is. But then we say, you know, if China has a, 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 an, a, a position at the main table, it'd be more democratic. Has the United States, as the so-called leader of the free world, asked us, about whether they should sanction Iran? Has the United States asked the world about whether they should bomb and, uh, Iraq and kill close to a million people? No. We turned a blind eye to this because apparently that, that sort of democracy us. will result in good decisions. Yeah. Well, the United States has hardly had a good president for the last 30 years, right? So democracy doesn't assure that. From what I know and for people who are interested, and this is controversial, I would say there's much more consensus building in China to the five tiers of the Chinese system in dealing with uh, issues than in most parts of the world. But most people don't want to know that. Most people will say he's lying. But if you know the Chinese system and know how rigorous it is, it is far from perfect. There are abuses, etc. But it actually builds consensus at right through and people work damn hard at it, right? So you got to understand the system. Is it, is it, is, has it got lots of imperfect, has it got imperfections? Absolutely. Are there violations of things that, you know, you and I disagree with? Of course. Are there violations in, the, in Malaysia? Yes. Are black people treated badly in the United States systematically? Yes. Right? So we need to be careful about that as well. So. Malaysia is like a, like a pimple in the ocean compared to what's happening around the world, right? We are, we are 
we're nearly negligible in we the global. We make the most rubber gloves, I'm told. Yeah. So we're not a pin pong. Yeah. And, we, and we, we have the best pole. headlines uh -huh. uh, for corruption. We're the best in corruption. Yeah. We make the most amount of rubber gloves. Yeah. Uh, we used to have the best squash female athlete in the world. Probably one of the best female athlete in the last hundred, uh, hundred years. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But no one recognized her exactly. because she's Nicole amazing. David, fantastic player. Yeah. Um, Incredible. And because she's a different you know, persuasion, yeah. let's just put it that way. But how does Malaysia deal with what's going on, right? Uh, how do businesses position themselves for this transition? Well, Malaysian businesses first need to deal with uh, the problems in this country, right? Uh, the, and the problems in this country, then in my view, will be affected by what's happening in the world. So what are the problems in this country, right? So before we say how do Malaysian businesses deal with that, well, I will argue that most Malaysian business leaders are essentially, for whatever reason, asleep at the wheel when it comes to the issues in this country. Most of them are Western educated, talk all that, uh, you know, that usual uh, business school uh, claptrap. Uh, but they are not even dealing with the fundamental issues in this country. They have bought into that narrative of the Harvard Business School, flat earth society stuff. But when it comes to then looking at this, uh, the, the country itself, they're all silent. I'll just give you one example, if I may. So we all know that, uh, that the, the major issue in this country is institutional racism. And institutional racism is essentially inflicted every corner of the public space and the business community. Many Malaysian companies are now, you know, uh, at a superficial level, subscribing to ESG principles and all of that because it's flavor of the month. And then we've got all the Western consultants, you know, feeding on that sort of carcass, right? Uh, talking about ESG reporting and they all love it. Uh, it, it it's not worth a stamp. Why? ESG, environmental, social, and governance, right? I'm not gonna talk about the environment one because that everyone knows that that stuff should have been done. Most don't do it. I'm just gonna talk about social. Right? So if you are signing up to the social aspects, what is the biggest social issue in Malaysia? It's racial discrimination and institutional discrimination at the business level. The JLCs in Malaysia uh, essentially practice racism. So, so Malaysian business leaders can talk whatever they want, but first sort things out at home. So I would argue that the JLCs, for instance, on the ESG, if they're pretending to be all compliant because that's a new fad, uh, first get their S right. The E is the easy stuff they should do. Most of them don't do it. They don't, they don't understand. And of course, the S is uh, uh, very much linked to the governance system. So I, I argue fundamentally, this country needs to essentially understand what is tearing it apart, what is uh, making it the laughing stock of the world, and most of our CEOs here are in denial. I can go to a conference on, uh, uh, in a business conference in, uh, in, in KL, I've been, when I raise these issues and all the CEOs are there, everyone looks her head down. I ask them a question, no one wants a reply because they're in denial. So global issues, of course, they're gonna come and hit us. Yeah. Uh, and but you can only hit your, you can only respond if you're resilient at home. If you have the best people working in the country, the best policy makers, but if you don't have meritocracy, even in your, in your private companies, in your civil service, in your think tanks, well, how are you going to respond to the resilience, uh, build the resilience you need to respond to, you know, international sort of winds and, and pressures? You can't. Yeah, yeah. And you only need to look at the management teams, the C-suites of the top GLCs to realize that uh, for the most part, they're comprised of one gender, one race and one religion. Uh, to the exclusion of nigh on, on every, everybody else. Now, the impetus for change isn't, doesn't seem to be coming, uh, Chandran, uh, despite the protestations of the media, people like yourselves, um, you know, being ostracized by, by you know, certain NGOs and you know, uh, media activists and what have you. Do you think the impetus for, ch what, what triggers, if at all, the impetus for change from the, from the S portion of the ESG part? It, does, does Malaysia ever change its stripes? Or does that impetus from change come from externalities like, say, for example, a China who comes in and says, okay, look, let's revamp the whole system. Let's just hire the best and the brightest. We can see that, right? Um, 
For 40 years, Proton didn't do great because they were not the most competitive company. And then a couple of years ago, when the Chinese came in via Jilly, uh, albeit at 50, 50, 49%, they were not controlling, but they came in and they revamped the whole management structure. And look, they, they're going gangbusters now. Of course. Yeah. So, so how does the impetus for change come? The impetus for change, uh, firstly, I believe, right, um, uh, those, of us, I mean, uh, those of us who are Malaysians, um, we have a very jaundiced view of the country. So I'm very, I'm, I'm very much of the view that we must change things, and we can. Jaundiced so, in the sense what? Cynical or pessimistic? We just have a few pessimistic. Yeah, okay. we just think nothing can change. Yeah. I believe things can change. I believe things are going to change, but on the surface, it looks like the sort of the old narrative, the old sort of um, uh, leaders, etc., are still in charge. I, I believe they're on their way out. There's a whole new generation come, but we need to equip them with uh, the, uh, different ways of thinking. And that's where, you know, from my point of view, the impetus can come, and you cover the business. I want the business leaders to speak up, right? So why don't the business leaders speak up? Why are they so silent? The other side of the coin will be, of course, the international community. But I'm not in favor of, you know, uh, appealing to the international community to help us because that's the, that's the typical trap of being subservient, looking to the West to solve our problems, etc. We need to solve our own problems, and I am convinced that there's enough talent in this country. Too many of us have abdicated responsibilities and basically getting a free ride. Those of us who are professionally are qualified, we live a great life in this country. And then, you know, in private dinners, we all complain because the quality of life in this country is great. But believe me, you know, it's going to swallow us up, this sort of entrenched uh, decay that is taking place in, in the country. And so we have to. So what's the impetus? I think it must come from business leaders. It'll come from international pressure. Let me just give you one, for, for one example of that. It will come from the fact that even in the, uh, in the, uh, in the more conservative parts of the of the world, in the Muslim world. And I, 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 I don't like to associate religion with the issues in this country. I think it's more racial and racist driven. Some people have sadly used uh, a great religion like Islam to, uh, to, to capture this, this rent-seeking economic racist ideology that they have to divide us. So I, I, I don't like to uh, you know, uh, talk about religion because all religions have their, have their um, I have, what can I say, they are pluses and we should respect people of different faiths. The main issue in our country is that the, the political elites uh, refuse to accept that their race-based uh, ideologies uh, need to be essentially removed. And our business leaders, many of them who are the Malay elites because of the extremist uh, you know, political structures, are not speaking up. They need to speak up. And the younger generation needs to also be to be made aware internationally. And I, oh yes, I was talking about the uh, the impact of other societies. Even a conservative Islamic nation like Saudi Arabia is changing. Right? In what way? Well, they are ba basically the crown prince is saying, you know, uh, Islam is very important religion, but you guys will not be calling the shots. We will call the shots. The states. We're going to modernize. They will modernize in a way that is good for them, you know, with Islamic values and traditions, but they are going to modernize. If you look at the UAE, which I know quite well, I mean, you know, they look about Malaysia and think we're just going backwards. But don't let's not go that far. Let's look at Indonesia. Look at the President Jokowi in Indonesia, who I, I reckon is probably the most wise leader in the world today, hardly spoken about revered by his people, even despite the political affiliations, revered for absolutely exhibiting the kind of traits uh, that are needed. And in Indonesia, they're moving far ahead of us, tolerance, understanding, respect for all of others. So I think the winds of change, as Indonesia changes, etc., sort of the backward sort of race-based policies of Malaysia will be swept aside, will be swept aside. I, I love the fact that you're this optimistic, Chandran, because sometimes yeah, I... Otherwise, was, how do you get up in the morning? I mean, yeah, how do you get up in the morning? To do interviews like this with you. Yeah. And people like you. And to um, spread the word that we can uh, fight the malice within our, our community. Yeah. Everybody needs a purpose, right? And for, for, for people like me, at least, in the media, our purpose is to try and address 
you know, life's inequities and, you know, to try and balance things out because it's a tough world and uh, there are winners and there's losers and there's sometimes very big winners and very big losers and things must change and things must change uh, for the better. Yeah, but even the media in Malaysia is too, you know, too worried about uh, honest conversations. You know, I, I did an interview last year, the, almost this time, with Astro and where with one of the most popular anchors in Malaysia. And I raised this question, it's all positive stuff about we need to change the world. Uh, we need to change Malaysia and the elephant in the room is the institutionalized racism. It went viral, you know, around the world to Malaysians all over. Within 24 hours, uh, Astro took it down, fearful. Fearful of what? I didn't insult, uh, I didn't insult anyone. I didn't insult the great faith of Islam. I didn't insult Malay people. But so we become, uh, particularly uh, the elites, we become our own prisoners, right? We have handcuffed ourselves because we don't have a narrative uh, that allows us to discuss these things in constructive ways, paint a picture of positivity and say, hey, we can fix this working together. I don't need to insult you. I, need to, I don't need to insult your religion, your race, but I'm gonna talk about the economic foundations, the social construct. We need to develop what does the world look like? Do you what do you want Malaysia to look like in 30 years? Do, do you know what, right? What you just talked about, it's this intellectual capture. It is this um, vilification of freedom of expression and thought, which is, which is at, at, at under, under attack here, right? For example, if you... Um, but no one came after me. And even yesterday when I met a lawyer about my new organization, yeah. about you know, the Malaysian Anti-Racism Institute, Murray, the first yeah. thing she said to me was, how come they haven't come after you? I said, well, I'm not a political party. I haven't attacked anyone. I haven't attacked. I am pro having a strong government in Malaysia, a government that protects the rights of all citizens and works particularly to, in the interests of the disenfranchised, many yeah. of whom, as we all know, are, are Malays. Yeah, so what I'm saying is this, this country, this attack on contrarian thought is, is happening all over the place. Like, for example, if you had stood up against taking a vaccine in the last two years, you would have become an enemy of society. You would have become ostracized, you would have been criticized, you would have been sidelined and marginalized by both your, your friends as well as your employer, probably, right? You can see the same thing with Canada and the Freedom Convoy and the government of Justin Trudeau. He, he actually, I think he froze bank accounts. It's a, how ridiculous is that? But but it's freedom of choice, and you, if you choose to speak out against what you believe to be not right for yourself, then you get attacked. There, there's something wrong going on here. Well, it's, there is, I mean, I have a slightly different view on that, uh, because I think there are different freedoms that we are allowed to. I think if someone doesn't take a, want to take a vaccine, uh, uh, it's up to them, of course, that's their, their right. I think at the same time, the state has an obligation to protect people, and it has something that I, I believe in, and I wrote about in my second book, which is the you know collective welfare overrides individual interests. And the pandemic has essentially brought that whole thing into conflict. In terms of the freedom of speech issue, I'm also not the greatest advocate of you know freedom of speech. I should not be, have the right in a multicultural country like Malaysia to go around insulting Chinese people. Well, that's not, that's, not, that's not what we were talking about, right? We're talking yeah. about just looking at something very obje objectively and, as, and assessing it and discussing and having a conversation yeah, sure. about whether it's right or whether it's wrong yes. and whether things should, should change. Yeah. There's, no, there's no attack on anything or anybody. Yes. It's just a discussion Discussion on should be grounds. absolutely allowed, but within the boundaries So that's what I'm talking about in terms of your interview on, uh, on Astro, which, yeah. is, which was taken down. You did, not in, you did not insult any politician. You did not insult any religion. You did not insult any specific person. But it was taken down. Why? Because it just offended the narrative. And that's the problem. That's the problem with anti-vaxxers and all, and all the criticism that they've been getting. Right? I think in um, my case, you know, if I can, it, it didn't uh, disrupt the narrative uh, only. It disrupted the narrative. Well, all sort of you know, discussions uh, will have elements that disrupt the narratives you believe in and I believe in, which could be different. What it did in this instance was essentially um, uh, play to what was perceived as fear on the part of those people who are part of the establishment. 
So they thought, they were fearful that they would have uh, reprimanded, fined, etc., for allowing something like this to be spoken. So they are, in a way, propagating the fear. Yeah, right? because their patrons and their funders and their advertisers are the establishment uh, I don't think it was an advertiser, it was just called the government. Yeah. yeah. But and that, I think, was second-guessing. I don't think anyone in the government found, would have thought uh, that this was offensive. But it's called self-censorship. Self-censorship is another disease in There's this country. There's a disease in this country. And particularly on this issue, my view is that uh, uh, you know, many self-censors, for instance, I wrote a piece this last weekend on the, the whole issue of education in Malaysia, particularly for the SPM, and I, uh, I argued that the, the, the sort of discrimination uh, in that is, is when you discriminate your children is that you're a country with no soul, right? And a couple of my friends said uh, they had circulated it around various uh, groups, etc. And when they circulate certain things, everyone comments. But in this one, it was very interesting, the racial divide. Because whilst I was not criticizing uh, uh, Malays as such, the system essentially is uh, absolutely uh, driven to provide privileges to Malays in the education system at the young age, uh, at the age of 16, which discriminates against non-Malays. And this is essentially no country in the world practices this. And many of my friends said, hey, you know, bro, none of my Malay friends dare respond. So they were censoring themselves. Yeah. Many agree with it, but they would dare not feel that in a mixed group they could say. Because if they said something, maybe someone else who is Malay would say, you betrayed the cause or something. So there's this fear. It's self-imposed. And in my view, that is essentially a repressed society, right? People so, are repressed. So you're doing this thing called Murray, right? Malaysian... Yeah. Anti-racism. Anti-racism. I may change the name because some people say, Maybe you don't want to call it anti something, you want to call it pro something. Pro something. Maybe I'll think of that. Yeah. So, what makes you think this could. Okay, so tell me about it first, right? And what, what makes you think it can work? Oh, because I'm just so positive and I'm an incorrigible <laughs> optimist, you know? But uh, it's not about thinking something can work, it's believing something must be done. That's very different. Uh, this is not a business. When it's a business, you go and say, do all the calculations, and you do the numbers, and you look all the market analysis. This is not a business idea. This is essentially an idea about something that you feel must be done. And I feel I'm in a privileged position that I can do it. I also feel that maybe, and I, I don't want to you know, suggest I'm in any way, uh, uh, anyway, more special than all the people who dedicate uh, much of their lives to this cause. But I'm bringing a different narrative. And I've seen that the narrative has galvanized certain people. So my video, that narrative, was so different that so many people said, hey, this is interesting. So uh, the idea is to essentially create a platform. And it's become very clear, none exists in Malaysia, uh, which are apolitical and essentially looks at these things from a different perspective in the point of view of being pro-Malaysia, but addressing is issues front on, with ver front on with very good analysis. So we're going to look at the issues of racism from the point of employment, governance, social contract, the environment, the rent-seeking meritocracy, but it's not an anti-Malay, it's not a pro-Malay, it's not an anti-vernacular you know, schools, it is essentially framing it in different ways. And the reaction I've had is so positive that I think it almost feels, someone said to me, this is a, you know, a different wind. So I'm it's going to give it a shot. So it's kind of like a policy think tank, right? I, I think ideas does, does something similar at, at certain levels. Well, they seem to be promoting democracy, which has failed in this country. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> Parliamentary I mean, democracy <laughs> robbed this country of so many things. And so I'm not, you know, it's, it's not a policy think tank only, it, well, because I don't want to just produce it could, reports. It could trigger policy change. I think that's The what idea is think. policy change. Yeah. So we want to produce very good reports. I have not seen a single report in Malaysia with all these think tanks uh, talking about race and the economics of racial base. Do, do you everyone's few, scared. Do, do you remember a few years ago, that I can't remember his name now, some, some okay, he was a Chinese guy, some, some professor of, of some academic of some yes. kind. He, he studied the um, the Bumiputra equity participation. Yes. I think at some point there was a target participation rate of 30%. And he 
postulated, I think, that it, it had gone beyond 30% because of the GLCs and GLICs that had held equity participation, and therefore th thus ren rendering the, the new economic policy uh, um, having the, met its objective yes. and therefore should be re rescinded. Yeah. He was swiftly taken down, and this is maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago. Yeah, I, I think the world's changed. Yeah. So, so now we have even Malays uh, talking about it because they understand. Correct. Uh, it's but he, essentially he, his research was, was laden with data, I believe. Yes. It, had, it had data, it data, had information, yeah, yeah. statistics. Yes. So what, what makes you think that uh, it can be different this time around with uh, Murray or whatever incarnation that will eventually... eventually well, to? it's not going to be a single report. It's not a one-off, right? Secondly, I think 15 years, you look at 2022, 2023, when we may hopefully produce, the world has changed. There's a whole discussion globally triggered by, of course, the Black Lives Matter, uh, Lives Matter movement about racial discrimination. Malaysia stands out as a country that is essentially, you know, uh, practices institutional racism on a scale no other country practices, and it's flown under the radar for so long. The world is going to find out about this. So I think the world has changed, Malaysia has changed, but the old supremacists and uh, a lot of the people who are the beneficiaries of this, as I said, people who are against it, you know, uh, Malays, etc., don't know what to say about it. Uh, and of course, as being beneficiaries, sometimes it's kind of difficult. So what we want to do here is essentially, it's not a single report. It will be well researched, very well done, but it's not anti-government, it's not fighting something. It's essentially supporting the creation of something new. So. Do I know it will succeed? Of course I don't know. But do, am I going to give it the best shot? Do I feel that this is what can change? If you look at other parts of the world, this is the kind of stuff you have to do to bring about change. Not rant and rave, yeah. have one report, yeah. create a political party, write op-eds. You know, I write a few op-eds, but I know that isn't going to change everything. It gives prominence to the, to the, sub, to the topic, but you have to do work. And this is not two years, three years. This is a generation of work. So we want to kind of create an institution, an institution that in 10 years from now, will then move on to other things. But I also have this view that this institution, so Malaysians can be proud of it, will be the institution that will be also talking about racism at an international level. You know, our Malay politicians are very, uh, uh, very ready to criticize the racist Israeli politics, which it is, you know. Um, but let's be uh, uh, the center for essentially talking about racism, uh, which is a non, uh, from a non-Western perspective, and how it essentially affects so many countries. But we are going to focus initially on starting in Malaysia and then make it an international thing. And that's hard work. And I'm hoping a lot of people will join us in this effort so that you don't have to just you know, be on the streets protesting every time there's a general elections. So what you're suggesting potentially is a, a country that goes from being one of the worst victims of racism to one of the world's leading Leaders. advocates of racial equality yeah. and progress. With that, that's a big sea change. That's it. Because we're a unique country. I mean, I know most people always think of their countries as unique. But you and I as Malaysians know yeah. that Malaysia is fairly unique. It's very unique at the point of view. It's three of the dominant sort of races from Asia, the religions, etc. You know, in Kuala Lumpur on a Friday evening, I can go to a Buddhist temple uh, in Brickfields, and 10 minutes later, I can go to the, the Hindu temple, and then I can go to the church, and then I can go to the masjid. Yeah. There are very few countries in the world where you have If you live in Penang, that 10-minute journey becomes a 30-second journey because they're next all sitting to, next to each next other, to each other, cheek by jowl. Yeah. And that's very interesting. And that is so interesting and unique. We should be leveraging that to, to make this country unique. So Malaysia is very unique in this sense in that it's worth essentially making it an exemplifier of how you do things in multicultural societies, and particularly one that has, you know, uh, a large Chinese population, uh, Indian population, which is smaller, uh, a Malay population, all the people are mixed race, and let's not forget the large indigenous population whom we often forget about too, right? And their traditions and their beliefs and all of that. So this, this is very unique and we have to do something. And Malaysia, I think, can stand out in different ways because we're not an Indonesia that went through all the bloodshed where the Chinese had to change their names, etc. We're not Thailand where the Chinese gave up the names and took, it's a different form of integration. 
where we can retain all our different identities, celebrate them, and be, uh, I, I really do think, a beacon to the world of how a multicultural society in the 21st century operates in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually um, quite keen to end the chat on such a high note because, you know, um, we, you know, we talk about changing world orders and there can be big global changing world orders, but there can also be many changing orders within ASEAN. And if what you say is correct, then, you know, you do get the sense that this is, it's a possibility, right? Because it just needs a few people to have a Absolutely. change of mind. You know, eventually people will die and, uh, you know, elderly people with, the, with all the luggage that they carry will move on and the next conveyor belt of people with new ideas come along and it can be as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, it's inspiring um, people, you know. So yeah. I, 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 when I speak to young Malay intellectuals and they talk to me about this, they're all concerned. I say to them, listen, right, you guys on a Saturday night, right, although Malaysian, you turn on the TV and support a football club in a strange place called Liverpool. I mean, what's up with you? Exactly. Right? right. And then you go to an even stranger place called, you know, uh, uh, Wolverhampton and you support some, some team. Who are you? But you guys can all identify with that. And then at the start of the match, you guys all you say, yeah, man, take the knee. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You don't even understand who's taking a knee here. Exactly. And whose knee, you, you, whose it's, neck you got your knee on. Yeah. Then they go, hey, but Chandran, this is not the same. I said, it's, it's the this, same, it's bro. Exactly the I said, it's the same. same. Yeah. We're just quiet because we haven't got wrecked yet in this country. So then it's kind of get them inspired to think about what this looks like. Uh, and that is a very important thing. We've got to inspire these people because that next generation will be different from the people that got us to, into this rut. The people who got us into this rut are still trying to infect a whole bunch of people with that sort of sickness, right? Because racism is a sickness. And when you institutionalize it, you're even sicker. We have to dismantle it. It's hard work. We're going to do that. And that's really kind of what I'm about. I mean, there's one point I wanted to also mention with regard to my, my, my book on, you know, white privilege. And I think you mentioned it in, in, well, before we started. And you said that, you know, some of the stuff I'm talking about, and I'm saying this now because we just talked about Malaysia. So some people say, oh, God, you know, you wrote this book about white privilege. You must be anti-white. <laughs> no, not at all. I said, you know what I'm doing in Malaysia? I'm putting my neck out there. Right? Yeah. Right. So when we talk about white privilege, one of the things that I get accused of sometimes is being anti-white. This is completely a superficial, uh, naive reaction or anti-Western. Not at all. I'm actually pro-world. Right. But what we need to understand is the sort of white privilege is woven into the entire fabric of globalization. We talked about rules based order. That's a globalized order, which I uh, and the Chinese had no say in the Indians, the Africans. And then the last point I wanted to just mention is, you know, a point you mentioned, which I think is very important. It can come across as, you know, white envy, envious of white people. Not at all. So if it's about uh, envious, then I'm happy to be called envious if I'm actually talking about injustice. So what my point is that white privilege, based on four, five hundred years, we talk maybe six hundred years of privilege, wrote the rules, created all the conditions, the way you and I need to speak, if I appear on BBC, the books I read, etc., is essentially inculcating my mind. To the extent that many of us even seek whiteness, you know, I, I talk about in the book. It's crazy. It's crazy. We have Asians who go to Australia and change their names because they seek acceptance. We know this. And recently I've had American, Chinese American friends who said, man, 40 years in this country trying to be a white man, Incredible, looking like right? me. And now it came back and bit me. Now you know. So I said, you guys know. So this is not about envy. This is essentially saying that social justice on a world scale essentially requires us to dismantle white privilege, not to make Western civilizations a secondary or relegated. Of course not. Western civilization is fundamentally important to the world. But you can't sit at the top and essentially be a minority and write the rules for everybody else and say, be like me or nobody else. Otherwise, I'll punish you. That's what my dismantling white privilege is. And if people want to say that trying to dismantle that is being envious, well, go ahead. Because then I will say, if you think dismantling social injustice on a global scale it's about envy. You've got it wrong. You're part of the problem. Exactly. Um, Chandran, you know, 
you are someone who um, who have taken what we discussed in restaurants and cafes and mama stores and then taken it up five or ten levels higher in such an educated, um, um, profound and, and, and intelligent and, and well thought out manner to have gotten the attention of the big publications and the big institutions around the world, that then makes you a rarity. So every time I talk to you, I feel it's a huge privilege and it's, it's a huge honor right. and you could well be one of the um, advocates or, or beacons of change or triggers of change that this country really needs. So, I mean, I can't thank you enough for coming on the channel two times to have given me all the time. In fact, your lovely house here and this lovely art, it's, it, it just beggars belief that I've got this huge privilege and opportunity to talk with you. And so thank you again, Chandran. Thank you. You, I, you, know, you, you. you give me the opportunity and then I come and try and express myself. And, but it requires someone who's willing to indulge me. So I yeah. appreciate your, your, your time. Well, hopefully your thoughts uh, and our discussion will reverberate through uh, the internet for many eons to come because hopefully YouTube and Spotify and Twitter and all these other things last through the ages. So thank you again, Chandra. Take, Take good care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Thank you.